All right. Howie, thank you for joining me. We're going to be talking about your vision of a project, of what it is you are looking to create in the world and what you're needing right now. And hopefully the idea is this will give a foundation either to know how to move forward with your project or how to start with that crowdfunding spark that you were wanting yeah. to discuss. Uh, so what I have right now is a white paper. It's the second draft. Uh, I was hoping to get feedback on how to improve it uh, from a couple of different people, and that kind of fell through. So I would have to figure out how to improve it on my own. Uh, but I, I think it's a, a good enough as a second draft to, to get started, you know. Uh, and what it is is a quant what I call a quantum neuron, but really it's just a a uh, high entropy neuron, uh, an object in computer programming, which has multiple algorithms, which output to connections to other neurons. And these algorithms can be combined in various ways or even isolated uh, so that they can, uh, you know, increase entropy in the com computational system. Uh, it does seem that entropy in a computational system is the source of more advanced function. Uh, so I, I seek to uh, enhance the amount of uh, entropy in that system. So I'd asked you yesterday um, what you meant by entropy, because I'm a scientist yeah. by trade. I was like, why? Yeah, uh, I don't entropy, quite, I know in Entropy usually world. refers to the, the whole world and, and the universe at large and particles. Uh, no, we're, we're just talking about computational systems, not increasing the amount of chaos in the world. Don't, don't need that. There's plenty of chaos out there already. Uh, yes, plus it's already happening. I mean, that's what the universe goes towards, is towards more entropy, which isn't really chaos. It's actually kind of more order, but more like dispersed order, which is not. Yeah. As humans, we're going to experience this chaos for sure. It means less energy, less other things. But um, I don't understand computers and quantum enough to be able to um, understand why it is that entropy helps helps make it faster. But even if that is true, is there not trade-offs? Is it not like even what you were just saying about neurons? I understand the brain. I understand neurons. I have biology. I also have my own brain stuff going on that like a neuron is an individual unit that fires and then it fires the other ones as well. That is, yeah. that's not living yeah. towards entropy. Um, in a human brain, a single neuron, uh, it, it just carries out a single uh, transference of uh, a chemical uh, signifier or a, a signal, a signal, a chemical signal. Uh, however, that chemical signal can go to multiple different neurons uh, adjacent to that individual neuron. And uh, that, uh, that single neuron can also be used in alternative forms of processing. Uh, psychedelics are, are a very uh, powerful tool in understanding this because they cause more randomness in the brain. Uh, parts of the brain which do not normally communicate uh, then communicate with each other. Uh, while someone is under the influence of a psychedelic. Uh, so that, that indicates that neurons can be used for more than one function. And uh, right now in uh, conventional computing, we have neurons which essentially have one function, one algorithmic out output, and, uh, but they output to multiple neurons. It, uh, and the way that it goes is that there are layers. There's a layer here, a layer here, a layer here, and it goes forward across the layers. Uh, the, the signal goes forward across the layers and is altered by each uh, neuron's algorithm. <clears throat> and the, the, the whole theory is that at the very end, you want a specific uh, output. And if you don't have that output, you have to go back and fix the uh, issues that are not giving, that are causing the output to be something other than what is desired. Uh, and in uh, a system such as, uh, what was it called, uh, convolutional uh, neural networks, which are essentially uh, highly complex, highly entropic, 
uh, neural networks uh, that often you don't, most uh, the, of the people involved in programming don't even know what's going on inside of them because they're just so uh, prolific and, and uh, uh, entropic. They, there are so many neurons within them that it's, it would be nearly impossible for a single human being to understand what is going on in there. Um, <clears throat> so, then, but, um, but, but so, the, yeah, so continue on and then I'll ask. Go ahead. You just froze and uh, I was going to ask a question that I forgot what it is. So continue on. <laughs> uh, I kind of forgot what I was saying. No problem. All right. So, um, the neurons, so it sounds like, it's like algorithms layered on top of each other that are so complex that even like normally I hate, <laughs> I hate, I love algorithms. They solve things and I would never yeah. be able to create one because even like Mathematica and university, I constantly wanted to like move over. Like anytime there's a formula, it goes wrong. There's one little thing out of place. That's why I'm very uh, glad there's other people to code because I'm not a coder, but it's like when someone's coding, they're doing that. It's like putting something in and kind of seeing the outcome and then going back and fixing it. When you have layer upon layer and it's the outcome that you're um, critiquing, right? You're saying, well, this isn't the outcome we wanted. That's not just an error. That's like, well, you did actually design it to have that outcome. That's why that outcome is there. And then you're going back and fixing it. That sounds like a lot of like human nature, value judgment. All of the issues are going to be interplayed in that as well. And we don't understand it. So it's not as simple as not one algorithm or one thing. We're not like, one, does this technology actually exist? You actually know how to do something like that. And I imagine it just exponentially creates errors also. Yeah, and uh, from my understanding, the way that uh, these errors are fixed by humans uh, is by adding more layers of neurons, which further complicates the system and makes it uh, more incomprehensible to a human uh, analyst and uh if, if you've ever seen any of those videos from uh google deep mind with the, the weird trippy effects on uh video footage uh though that is uh a visual uh neural network attempting to understand the data that is is uh being put into it uh and and that the the deep mind has Last I, I checked, it was uh, 1.5 billion neurons, which is a lot. That would take a lifetime to read through. More than, yeah, for sure. So um, what is it that, what is like a minimal viable product or a first step that this can be used and shown proof of concept on that can happen rather soon? Well, I have... Uh, a design for a, a series of layers that comprise uh, 170 neurons. And uh, it is my belief that with these high entropic uh, neuron objects, uh, a 170 neuron network uh, could possibly do as well as a neural network with a couple thousand neurons. And a 170 neurons, if uh, programmed, could only take up about 250,000 lines of code, uh, which is very possible. Uh, a single person could do that over the course of a couple of days. <clears throat> and then what do you do with, like, so is that the proof of concept then creating this neural network yeah. and proving that it's faster than the other ones with like more fast with less code or as yeah. fast with less code. as fast with less code that uh if if we are able to get this thing created and test it um i would hope that uh we could ha have it uh programmed in such a way that it could be attached to just about any system uh for for example, a firewall. Let, let's say a firewall. You could program a firewall in about 200 lines of code and <clears throat> have this 250,000 lines of code uh, making alterations to the firewall in real time as it faces uh, 
threats and attacks and whatnot. Uh, and if that if that works, uh, that would be a very very advanced system with a very 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 small amount of code. And so need to have that experiment to come to fruition. Yes. And my problem right now is that I only have my phone that I can use. And my phone definitely does not have the space for 250,000 lines of code on it. It's I've got I checked this morning. I've got about two gigs uh, of space free on my phone. 250,000 lines of code. Uh, that might fit in a gig, uh, but I, I wouldn't risk it. So you need a computer, and then yeah. you can you by yourself can run this process and figure I, it I out. I have a computer. Uh, I just don't have uh, the ability to get it online right now. I would need a, a Wi-Fi adapter and... Uh, uh, probably a Wi-Fi booster because uh, you know the nearest Wi-Fi is uh, about a block away from me. I'm I'm using the Wi-Fi right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that sounds like a rather easy problem to solve. Like someone either has a computer, or someone has Wi-Fi. You go to it, you go closer to the Wi-Fi, and <laughs> like, I, does this thing need to yeah. continually run? So you need constant Wi-Fi. For, it to well, be able to I, for, for how much time going, do you need Wi-Fi? If I'm going to be testing it, uh, say, on a, uh, on a firewall, I would need to have access to Wi-Fi for a sustained period of time, maybe an hour, maybe two hours. Um, in order to program the, 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 the 250,000 lines of code, I could do that offline, but I wouldn't really have much of a way to test it, and I definitely wouldn't be able to send it anywhere. Uh, so, which, which would yeah, be ideal. To solve this, like, what is the? There's enough people that are interconnected with the pro the previous project that either have computers or Wi-Fi or like, I mean, you don't have what you know what I mean. <laughs> they have yeah. computers that are capable of Wi-Fi that you can plug in at any coffee shop and go and do that for a few hours. Yeah. So uh, my is the, the problem actual... with my computer is that it's a it's a desktop. It is a big bulky desktop. And it would actually require either a specialized Wi-Fi adapter with uh, Linux capability uh, or an Ethernet cable. And that would just, you know, be problematic. Take a, a big, bulky desktop into a coffee shop, people kind of turn their heads. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> that would not quite work. How, I mean, it would not work, but you're right. People would turn their heads. Um is there a reason that you can't get a laptop that does this so that it is something you can physically bring with you other places to show? Because I imagine having it on a desktop if you're trying to like show investors or future users doesn't really work anyway, even if it's going to be on desktops that most people are using them. Well, I, ideally, uh, I would actually send them a copy of, of the system so that they can try it out for themselves. Um, and then... If they like it, I can make a more advanced system with more more lines of code, more more neurons in the network. Um, right now, the biggest issue with getting a laptop is that I don't have the money for it. Uh, I was planning on uh, getting my tax return and and using that to help fund some of my projects, and I haven't gotten my tax return yet. So when does the tax, when the tax return comes, is that what you're going to spend it on? So it's just a time uh, problem waiting believe, for that to come yeah. But the, the problem is uh, I have no idea when, when my tax return is coming. I've, I've contacted the state revenue department and gotten no answers. Um, they, they sent me a letter saying that I need to send in a tax return which doesn't make sense because I have documentation proving that I did send in a tax return. And I just, I have no idea what's going on. It's been uh, about three months and I haven't gotten, you know, my, my, my money yet. 
Good old governments and bureaucracy. Yep, I don't have yeah. a solution for that besides dismantle those and create better systems. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there's there's lots of problems with government, uh, especially uh, you know my my state. Uh, our government is incredibly bureaucratic. It took me about three months to get an ID in my state. Uh, I I had to try every week for three months. And each time it was a different person behind the counter and they kept asking for different information. And I kept bringing all the information I had brought before, all the information that had been requested of me before. And they kept asking me to bring more and more. And it just dragged out for three months. Yeah, I am employed by the federal government here and it's not a... <laughs> Oh God! It's, shit shit. it's bureaucracy. It's not that. Uh, not. <laughs> but having so back to I did read your paper and AI. Like I said, I'm not versed on AI, but one of the things you talked about was like the risk factor of AI, which I'm definitely the project that we met each other through. Um, yeah. They cannot possibly well, that... see risk. They are blind to risk. Therefore, they can't mitigate for risk, and that is the scariest thing to me. Isn't that yeah. AI is scary? It's that if you're not going to if you're not going to acknowledge it could be scary, it's scary. Is that the paper that uh, I wrote for physics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I have those two papers. I have the one on the quantum neuron and I have the one on uh, that I wrote for physics. Uh, yeah. The one for physics, I did cover some of the risks of AI and uh, how uh, the system that was proposed could possibly uh, prevent it but uh, right now there are enough human humans aware of the risks that uh, you know if if a, a problem does arise with AI we could easily take care of it uh, at least I think so not everyone well, part will, of the problem my, you would talk agree. about were like telomeres right and I am by yeah. trade geneticist it's what I took in university yeah. and uh, the issue is of course telomeres are there they're on our chromosomes and they are limiting the amount of times that we can read our cells can reproduce. We don't have to manufacture telomeres into the system. They already are there and we have to figure them out and work with them. The issue with code is you actually have to put on those telomeres yes. and therefore it's up to the coder, whether they're putting it on and mo it's harder to put them on than to not put them on. So what's the incentive for mm -hmm. people who are ignorant to risk to do that when it's when they're not yeah incentive. that that is a problem <laughs> and and that is something that is concerning is that people are pushing forward without taking any safety precautions um i, I specifically envisioned uh digital tele telomeres as uh being necessary for self-replicating software software which would uh you know make a improvements on itself and make a copy of itself with those improvements. Uh, and the telomeres would uh, basically just be uh, uh, an object or, or uh, a couple lines of code, which would say, once you've reached this point in your development, stop reproducing. What stops it from just saying, no, if it oh, gains well, that, any kind of sentience, any kind of wanting to not do that, it's not that hard for it to rewrite well, see, its code. At that it's point, fun. we have Skynet. At that point, we have Skynet and we're screwed. <laughs> right, which is what we don't want. So, like, yeah. if, if the telomeres are there to stop Skynet, how does it actually stop Skynet if it can just redo the redo the code? Well, if uh, if the telomeres themselves were separate programs from the AI. And the telomeres had a higher, uh, what's what's the word? Um, a higher place in the hierarchy of, of uh, things, because that's that's the way that uh, computer programming works. There's a hierarchy, uh, an order of things that uh, takes place. And if uh, and there's also levels of importance which are written into uh, computer code. Now, if uh, uh, if the telomeres were given a higher importance in, in their program than the AI itself, then the AI would not be able to override that. 
unless it, it found a way to, you know, write its own code. But uh, w hopefully we would only have, uh, if we were going to have uh, replicating software, we would only have software which would make minor improvements and then replicate that and not just replicate until, you know, it is sentient. That, that would uh, be uh, ideal. Yes, ideal is not how the world works, though. So yeah, but uh, I, I I do also think that uh, because of our limitations, our our computational limitations of hardware, of hardware, uh, that that is also uh, kind of far off in the future. And that's we where do. my um, understanding of the complexity of where we actually are with technology isn't advanced enough for me to like it's like my knowledge comes from philosophy and the media and like yeah it, i don't know how to actually code it i can just it, like invoke the, the god of algorithm as like oh an algorithm solves that without actually writing it coding it doing anything like that but i could also envision skynet so it's like that yeah well I, line, like letting I, it I, learn I, letting it do it to help us without it getting sentience and taking over. Yeah, and I, I find Skynet to be just point. way too far off in the future. Uh, for in my view, Skynet is 40, 30 years off from from right now. About uh, that, that would be much more of a hardware limitation, in in my opinion. Now, I would hope to advance uh, software so that we could probably get to that point more quickly. Uh, but that would still you know, let's say 15 years as opposed to 30. Uh, that That's still plenty of time to be prepared to uh, install pre precautions and take uh, measures against, uh, you know, a, a sentient computer uh, taking control of itself or losing its mind. The issue, though, with a lot of the, the AI, the envisioning of the dystopian AI future is that AI learns faster and propagates faster than we ever can. So we are then in competition with the microbe, the microbes of this planet that out evolve us because they reproduce much faster and a computer that actually can outthink us because when it learns and it grows, it can download copies for everyone in that. Um, like how can humans that are very fractured and can't agree on anything like even if one person could see how to stop skynet we're not going to listen to that one person and it's not going to be elon musk who comes up with the, how to stop skynet so yeah. how do you actually like 15 years from now we'll stop it well we're letting it run amok no like it's like they, no. the equivalent <laughs> that i can see in genetics is gmos and gmos have run amok gmos can could have been it should have been still should be that you do not you're not allowed to put gmos on the market unless you make them self-terminating unless you make it they cannot interbreed with one another and they cannot interbreed with wild plants you can do that rather easily probably yeah. easier than putting telomeres on technology but it costs money and what's the incentive why would monsanto do that when they can just fuck it all yeah, the extra um my understanding world. is that with those uh, those GMOs, uh, the vast majority of them are self-terminating. Like they only grow one generation. They may put out seeds, but those seeds are sterile. Um, and this is due to copyright. Uh, Monsanto actually has copyright on its right. GMO. Legal. And it's it, legal. It's not biological. So biologically, yeah. it can go on and self, which is why people have sued them. Because it goes and breeds with their plant. Now your organic plant is no longer organic. And they get sued for stealing intellectual property because the bees brought it over. Yeah. That's that's a legal thing that biology doesn't give a fuck about, right? Like biology is not like, well, legally the copyright belongs to you, so we won't interbreed. They haven't done the actual technology to stop it from interbreeding. Or it's a very kindergarten technology that the plant can easily out-evolve <laughs> and be yeah. like, well, a new way a new mechanism yeah um i i do think that uh that paper on the q vote that i wrote for physics uh that does actually help out a little bit uh it's not the end all be all it's not a unicorn um but it 
if we as a species can come to a a more uh, general understanding or a more precise understanding uh, generally speaking uh, as a society then when that one person comes up and says hey here's how we can stop uh here's how we can prevent skynet from rising up and and starting a, a machine rebellion uh people are going to be more willing to listen uh then you know if, if that vote thing actually exists at that point uh people who hear this can go and vote on it. and uh as, as uh amalgamated data is is uh gathered the the closest answer to the truth comes out by people voting on whether they think it's true the closest approximation to the truth comes out because that's one of my definite fail points of q vote yeah. is that democracy is not truth democracy yeah. how we feel about something isn't actually make it true or not true and yeah, it doesn't actually we, the person who actually feel about what the fuck is going on to get their voice heard if anything it dims it out how we feel about things is does not change whether something is true or not that is absolutely absolutely true uh but uh in my in my paper i did mention i did actually cite uh it was a vsauce video uh which discussed how uh the amalgamated guesses of all participants leads closer to the true answer than to than any one uh guesser on their own got and which is we talk about like jelly beans at the county fair right yes. like yeah yeah because crowd uh, crowd intelligence is great for that sorry one second My Very important. Guess the most popular LPS YouTube channel. <laughs> Can that wait? Can that wait a few minutes? Anyway, sorry. Um, what were we just talking about before LPS YouTube entered my brain? Um, the jelly beans. Jelly beans, right. So that's a, like, there is a certain number of jelly beans in the jar, right? And yeah. so they know how many there is. If I underguess and you overguess, yes, we get the closest... It's going to get closest with that crowdsourced information that any individual can do. That's really and, cool. It's one of the reasons I love crowdsourcing. However, let, let, let's apply that within the context of, of the Skynet thing. Let's say uh, there's five different people who have come up with different answers. One person says uh, we need to completely abandon technology altogether. Uh, one person says we should put in digital telomeres. One person says we should... Uh, uh, you know, put in certain restrictions, uh, such as like keeping the AI from interacting with the internet. Uh, you know, we, we get all these answers together <clears throat> and we have different reasonings for these different answers. And maybe the answer is a combination of, of some. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't uh, speak with a, a absolute authority on what the answer is right now. However, I, I do have my ideas. Um, if more people are involved in uh, regulating the system, we could perhaps get much closer to a, a thoroughly preventative measure, which also does not completely obliterate the AI. I still don't think democracy lead like you, there's a lot of assumptions in that in, in that like one little um i can't think of the word is I, scenario right that there's like yeah. five issues for ai well first of all there aren't five there's infinite right there's yeah. like infinite <laughs> solutions including let's not touch it well if we're never going to allow for let's not touch it right because we want to advance as a species so even if 99 percent of people were like fuck it no ai we do not want skynet no ai the one percent that wants it can just make it in their garage like there yeah. isn't a way to actually stop them it's not a democracy it's actually the person who's most willing to take risk with the least amount of of safety net 
that's going to get ahead and do it. Because even if there's people who are willing to go with the democracy and are willing to listen to risk, they're going to be at a disadvantage, not an advantage. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, also having more people involved in the discussion would also have more eyes on it more more programmers would be able to see what's going on and they would be able to intervene if you know the program began uh taking a a, a skynet turn um the more the more people you have uh like, like let's say uh, a nuclear power plant uh, you have these rods that go down into the block which prevent a, a certain amount of neutrons from being released. Uh, and uh, if an error occurs, you have a certain number of people in, in the building who can do something about it. But if you have more people who are actively watching what is going on, you have more people who can take action uh, in the event that an error occurs. Now, I'm not saying that that's the end-all be-all, but I, I do think that that is a, a definite help. And like I said, I, I am not sure. I'm not sure 100% uh, if I have the answer on how to prevent Skynet from forming. But I do believe that uh, we do have plenty of time to figure that out. And we do have, we already have several million programmers who are uh, paying attention. And in the future, that, that number seems like it will go up. Uh, and, you know, getting more people involved in, in programming and getting more people involved in uh, AI specifically uh, would, would provide more, uh, more people who could intervene in the case of, of an emergency. Yes. I mean, there's also the, like, my guess is Google probably has an AI department and they're not working publicly. They're not working out in the open. They're not being transparent. So we don't get to have a say in whether or not they're doing that. They have the money, yeah. they have the power. We don't need to do it publicly. Whereas people like you and I, that are still trying to find the people still trying to get those, those things happening. We have to build in public more so to create that trust and create that, that buzz. And although there's a, there's a, betterment to doing that in public because the public can trust it more that the fact that it's in competition with google that it's in like there's a again first to market and willing to take the risk for humanity is going to have an advantage over people who are like right but let's discuss this to the nth degree right like let's have all the discussions and that's part of my again critique yeah. of cube and the like that it's just a, a colorful slider it isn't actually a discussion tool in fact, that's where yeah. it generally part. If you look at their platform, it's like, well, what am I voting on? Am I voting on the the like thing that, that this person said about this? Am I voting on whether this thing makes me angry that it even exists? Or am I voting on the fact that it's like emotions a bad gauge because you don't know why am I? This is making me angry. I mean, they, the thing we had earlier today, right? Like it's like yeah. we're not necessarily reacting to the actual thing. We're reacting to all of our history, all of our trauma, all of and it's like I don't even know what I'm reacting to. And I've done a hell of a lot of interpersonal work to generally know what I'm reacting to. And I still always don't know re what I'm reacting to. I know I'm angry yeah. and it takes me a while to be like, oh, I was angry about that. So having a news feed that you're just voting on is like, well, there's so much intercomplexity there that without like Nora Bateson's warm data and without integral and without all of the like interconnectedness you're like taking something apart and and saying like taking a watch apart and saying the components are the watch when it's not and that it's time and it's infinite yeah. and it's a time machine it's like it's none of those things it's a watch you broke <laughs> yeah it's like is pudding pudding before you mix it all together um but uh what i was thinking uh you know this uh, this high entropy uh, neural network that I'm discussing uh, that could help with the transparency issue uh, because it is uh, it, it is less code and uh, fewer neurons and could be more easily read by a human. 
which means that uh, there there would be much more ease of access for humans to understand what is going on inside of the the neuron uh, inside of the uh, system and uh, well that that by itself is transparency and if uh, if there is a problem with it uh, someone would more more easily be able to point out what that problem is where it is located and how to fix it yeah that's the beauty of open source but you're also in competition with people who aren't doing that who at this point yeah. in history have an advantage for not doing that but there are ways to judo that same energy against them i just don't think ai and in like currently what's happening is the um most beneficial way because then you're you're literally talking about ai and they can see people like having the discussion having the governing model around ai and anything someone could see if because i don't understand the code i would never be able to see what's broken in it but if i can actually trust if there's actually a system where i can see that other people who know that information can see that code and they can see it i can more trust that that um the experts in the system are going to be able to find those things. But if we're open and transparent as a society and we don't own the technology that we're using, like Google, like Facebook, and they're able to work in secret without a lo awful lot of us with a lot of money and or power, we like they can easily steal the idea that is come up with in that way and implement it in secret. Whereas we're having all the meetings, all the governance, all the time, and they're they're easily able to steal that information. Yeah, and I have actually heard that uh, you know, even YouTube uh, administration has no idea what's going on in, in, in its algorithms. Its algorithms are so complex, and it has so many of them uh, that it, it does its job, but what is its job? They, they don't even know. They don't know how it's working. It's too big, too complex. No one is going to be able to read, you know, those however many billions of lines of code are behind these billions of neurons uh, firing off. <clears throat> but if we can, if we can reduce that, uh, bring it down to a couple hundred thousand lines of code, that's readable. That's something a human could go through in a month, maybe a week, if they're really, really good at it. And uh, it also does depend on the, uh, the programming language which is being used. Uh, for example, Java. Java is very user-friendly. It's It reads like a book. You can take a, a program in Java and read it. You can just read it. You don't have to know a whole lot of special knowledge to be able to read through that uh, a, a Java program. But if you get like MATLAB, uh, MATLAB is a very, very complex language with a lot of, I don't even know. <laughs> like a single line of code in, in MATLAB is completely incomprehensible to me. Um, so, and, and MATLAB, of course, is, is usually used by high-level scientists, uh, usually government scientists. Uh, so it probably is uh, used in, in AI at a very high level right now. Have you been involved in the, um, oh, they say it all the time and I literally can't remember, the like open source communities that, that deal with this stuff and actually have the, like have these discussions constantly in public because those seem to be the people that if you do have an actual layered algorithm code neuron thing, they would be the ones to better able assess it. And if they can see the value there, might have a computer to give you, might have like they're looking to help people. They're open sourced humans that are yeah, I, like we're I haven't had a project. whole lot of interactions with with that community. Honestly, uh, I tend to keep to myself uh, more than anything else. Um, it would actually be nice to to pass my paper by them and see what they think, though. Yeah, I don't I don't remember what the name of the community is, but I can ask I can ask Bentley because he will and or my brother, they will both know what I'm, what I'm referring to in my head that I don't remember the name of, because they both are, are involved in it uh, constantly, more so Bentley. Um, what was my question? 
So your project, right, creating this thing, like you said, the stall point right now is the having a laptop or having Wi-Fi, having that, that yeah. the hardware, right, to be able to do it. Um, yeah, my issue is a hardware issue right now, not not so much a software issue. Uh, not so even once that, once you do online. have that computer, what and yeah. you write it, it like it sounds to me like you're a, a solo project, which is great. That's that's but yeah. like how I know you is from the Discord where you're trying to get other people on your project. What is there for other people to do here? What is there for other people to be involved with? Well, other people can take the idea and, and experiment with it, uh, which itself would also help me out because if, if other people are experimenting with, with my idea, uh, they can give feedback on it, they can improve on it, they can uh, you know, show where the flaws are, uh, which right now I'm in the dark about all that um, because it's really just me and uh, you know, I, I haven't been able to actually make the thing. And uh, it would also be cool to see how people adapt it and what kinds of use does they put it to. Yeah, I mean, but that also sounds uh, it's it sounds to me like um, with the my with the together tech project that I'm in, it's about like the project of projects. And we do show up when we talk about like our project and what's stopping it and how to move it forward and trying to, we have yet to, but trying to create the common tools that we all use. This doesn't sound like a project that somebody would need to leave theirs in order to cut. Like it does sound like you're, it's your project, your, and you're needing feedback for like how to improve it yourself and people it's somewhat open source. People can run with it and do what they want with that same information. And it's about creating the interconnected community that um, you feel part of and a contributing member of uh, without necessarily having people on your project, which may or may not work because they might want to take it in a different direction. Or then you have to figure out governance and funding and everything else. Yeah. When you, It's more complex when you have other people involved, for sure. Yeah. Um, honestly... I'm not sure what I was doing with with uh, you know taking taking all those people and work, trying to work with them. Um, I think I was trying to help them out more than anything else, but that seems to be falling through. <clears throat> Which I don't think is on you. I think the person who brought them together had, didn't. There is no commonality that. Like the thing they were there for fell apart and no one's even owned that it fell apart because it's like yeah. everything I've been pointing to for months. Like the funding model is breaking your very thing. You don't have a funding model. When do you make the money? When does this actually happen? And they are bringing people on board without anywhere to put them. And then they get yeah. in conflict because it's like then when there's money involved, well, who's getting the money and who decides on what? And there's no governance structure. And this is I am someone who I deeply believe the technology is a tool we can use to get us to a better, beautiful world. But technology itself is not the answer because we're still human. And that was the other solution to AI. I think I read in one of your papers, um, which I think is the more key one. And it's the harder one to do, but it's more feasible than telomere, which is humanity evolves to the point yeah. that Skynet, it, the Skynet's obvious job isn't to kill us. Right, like we get that when AI becomes sentient, it's, it's baby it makes sense to kill the humans. It's what we would do if there was another species. It's what, like, we're a cancer, we're a parasite on this planet, and yet at the same time, if we evolve beyond that, where we're actually generative, where we're actually working with our planet, then the AI can be in service to that, even if it gains sentience in a way that's not like, well, obviously we kill all of you parasites. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> Humanity evolves, so we're not a parasite. I, I think that uh, there are solutions to uh, humanity's parasitism that do not involve uh, just wiping us out or going zero carbon all at once. Um, I, I actually have designs for other things, things which are not uh, software, things which are not technically technological uh, things 
which have nothing to do with computer science. Uh, I have designs for what is known as an arcology. And an arcology, I don't know if you're aware of what an arcology is. Are, are you? No. Uh, an arcology is basically a gigantic building, which is a self-sustained city in and of itself. Um, now, these are generally in sci-fi, but I have a design which uh, sort of makes it an, uh, a somewhat open system. Uh, you have these towers, right? And the towers are set up in a grid uh, format. And in between the grid, you have uh, like gardens or public spaces. And you can actually hang uh, fake land, artificial land, from in between the towers to create more space. And, and it is technically feasible, uh, but it would be in incredibly costly. And I definitely do not have the funds for that. <laughs> Which is also, I mean, anything, right? And this isn't on you, but like, you don't know whether something works until you actually build it and play with it. And yeah. I know from human history that we really like creating things like biodomes and enclosed systems, and we never get it right. I mean, the closest we've yeah. been able to do is the stuff that goes to space, because it has to. You have to recycle your water. You have to. And even that isn't infinitely recycled. You can't infinitely live in space. You have to have the people who live in the space station have goods and like brought to them constantly. If humanity goes under, they're dead. We're, they can't live up there and indefinitely with their system. Yeah. And, you know, when we've created biodomes, it's like we always forget a very intrinsic piece of it. Like, oh, we can't sterilize the soil and then have it grow stuff because it turns out there's more to soil than just inorganic material. There's organic material. There's and protein. That, there's that's so much. actually part of why Biosphere, the, the Biosphere 2 project from uh, 19, the early 90s, I think it ended in 1992. To, but technically is still ongoing, but they opened it up and now it's basically a museum. Uh, the problem that, that they had uh, when they had that catastrophic uh, loss of oxygen and, and decline in food, that was actually, they chose a kind of cement that interacted with the bacteria in the soil in such a way that it began eating the oxygen. And they, they have fixed that. But no one's gone back and, and tried to seal themselves up inside of the biosphere. Uh, but the, yes, you are you. right. Uh, space, space stations are pretty much the closest thing we have to a, a functioning uh, biosphere. Uh, I mean, we have a really beautiful biosphere. We just fuck with we, it. Yeah, we have a very we beautiful biosphere. We, we just keep destroying it. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. The 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 artificial biospheres, the most functional ones, are the space stations because they have to. Be. And you are right; they they also have to have supplies uh, constantly shipped up to them, uh, which is very energy consuming and also causes damage to the land here because when we send rockets up, we're basically polluting the air. And any debris that falls off also falls into the water and gets in there and pollutes that. Uh, <clears throat> I have seen systems. Uh, have you ever heard of aquaponics? Yep. Uh, aquaponics is really cool. Uh, for people who don't know, an aquaponics system is essentially a hydroponics system which uses fish instead of uh uh, actual filters, uh, artificial nutrient sources, and and whatnot, and the fish uh, the fish live off of food that is grown in the system. Uh, the fish defecate and urinate, and that goes into the water, which then is funneled out into the rest of the system where it feeds the plants, and that's that's very efficient. It's it's a a very functional cycle, uh, which which, uh, if done right, can produce an overabundance of food. Uh, there was a family, I believe, in New Mexico that had an aquaponics system built into their 
pool. They had a, a backyard pool and they converted it into an aquaponic system. They had tilapia growing in it. They used duckweed, which is technically a superfood, to filter the water. And duckweed is edible. So they fed it to their fish. They fed it to their chickens. They fed it to themselves. And they duckweed grows. It, it is a weed. It grows a lot. It, it grows exponentially. And uh, so you, you have to take the duckweed out of the filtration system otherwise it clogs up and causes trouble so you have to eat that so you can end up with an abundance of food just from that alone uh, but given the uh, reproduction rate of tilapia uh, they actually th this family had to get at least one fish out of their pool every day otherwise they would overpopulate and kill themselves off So that that's two sources of food, which. But tilapia is not. What was that? Like it's not a, a tilapia. They're not like how many a, a grown adult if they were getting all of their calories from tilapia. Would they? How many would they need to eat a day? One. Uh, I don't I really think, know how many tilapia. Are. I think uh, that would be closer okay. to five. If they were only eating tilapia, you would have to eat about five to get. The, to, to match the 2,000 calorie rate uh, of the, the daily recommended diet. So one tilapia um, a day. But that's... Even though that's an overabundance isn't actually enough to sustain even their family. And this is the problem well, with having very yeah. non-complex ecosystems is, although duckweed sounds like a superfood, I've never tried it. And tilapia is great because it, you know, it's part of the system. And you can even get heat off the system. The the less species there are in your ecosystem, the more as an individual you're not going to be super happy because I don't want to live off of duckweed and tilapia. Yeah. And the more you're not going to be able to, if there's a problem, right? If there's if there's a, a new bacteria that eats tilapia, then the, it collapses. Whereas again, the biosphere we actually have is really yeah. great because it's more interconnected and and it feeds yeah, the, off. the family that i'm referring to they did grow other plants as well but generally uh you know tomato plants take several months to to reach maturity um peppers and and uh gourds of various sorts can take almost a whole year uh depending on the climate <clears throat> and uh, so they did have other other things to eat, but that was their primary thing because they have to take it out every single day. Mm -hmm. They have to clear out uh, duckweed and at least one fish every single day, otherwise the system collapses. But that's that's something that I see as a positive. When you have to take something out of your system in order to prevent it from overpopulating, I see that as a good thing. Yeah. Producing abundantly, yeah. I mean, it is yeah. a difficult thing. And, if you want, uh, I, thing, do see... that's like, I would rather do it the other way around. And it's you cannot do it on a family scale, but having it be like, I don't, I don't want to eat tilapia and duckweed. I want to eat what I eat, yeah. and then I want that produced by the system in a way that's sustainable. And then it feeds back into the system, so that if we run out of tomatoes, we know next year we have to grow more tomatoes. And what does that look like to give tomatoes what they need, so I can get what I need, as opposed yeah. to like even companion plants, I'm like, eh, but I don't want the companion. I'm like, I don't want the legumes. I only want, the, I, want I want the berries. I don't want the this. And it's like nature doesn't necessarily produce in a way that we want. But then there's pigs and things that can eat the stuff that we don't like, that we can eat them yeah. then. And it's like the more species there are in the system, the more it can work. But, but like I, I do see a lot of potential for a system like that. Um, you, you could go any route with it really uh, i've envisioned a system basically using a, a swimming pool but uh, a saltwater system which uh uses shellfish as a filtration as opposed to duckweed and with that sort of system you could have you know multiple kinds of shellfish you could have clams mussels uh, crabs shrimp all growing side by side uh, and then in the actual fish container you could have multiple species of fish you could have uh, a couple kinds of seaweed 
Uh, seaweed is a superfood. Uh, I like seaweed. I wouldn't eat it every day. But uh, And then, of course, that would then cause a problem because you can't feed land plants using uh, salt water. Uh, that would dry out the soil. That would cause damage to the roots. And that's just not good. But yeah, so, uh, so we have a couple you know, more it, minutes it and I got to go. Is there anything uh, else you want to say about AI or what you need for the project or what kind of people you may be looking for? Like what is definitely easier than a group of people to work with is one person to work with. I have a way to get to a better, beautiful world. that's going to take 10,000 people. And my project yeah. has stalled at this one person, particularly her and I working together and it's actually perfect that it's stalled because we're iterating and, and making it work for us that will then make it work for the system. And we work well together. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'd work well with you if there were other people involved right now. It works really well one on one because then you're like negotiating with one person instead of with 30, right? Or with 20. And if you can't negotiate with one, you can't do it with 12. So if you were if you were gonna find a partner to work on this with, what would that partner look like if that's if you uh, like someone that? someone who is as avid of a researcher as I am someone who is open-minded enough to engage with ideas that might seem nonsensical on the surface, but could have use, uh, if distilled down, um, really, uh, someone who I, I can actually discuss complex ideas with, uh, and uh, have have them actually be able to provide feedback. I mean, if you want to come to the Game B Projects Together Tech Facebook group, are you on? No, you're not on Facebook. You got kicked off Facebook, right? Yeah, I, I am. I, I am a band off Facebook. So that doesn't work. But there is. Um, like that other one that I can I can give you the name of that is about helping people on their projects. It's not the project of projects that is together tech, but it is very close. It's that open source people helping each other with their open source projects. And you will find people who absolutely want to talk about big ideas. They might not want to talk about exactly, you know what I mean? You might not find one person who wants to talk about all the big ideas that you want to talk about. That's like finding yeah. a marriage partner, right? Like next to zero. But Finding someone who you want to talk to AI about, not a problem. There's dozens. Someone that you want to talk to about this scientific paper, not a problem. There's dozens. And you know what I mean? You might, you just won't find yeah. someone who believes everything you believe. Your, um, the, the emotion that's evoked when somebody disagrees with your worldview is something you might want to play in more and more. Because the more you encounter that and the more you're actually able to do this, have a video chat with someone so you're able to practice Omega Rule and actually able to see their humanity because it's really hard behind a keyboard. We infer yeah. everything into what someone says and then react to what we infer instead of what is actually the human being in front of us. It's really easy. They're not a human being. They're words on a screen, right? They're an icon. They're not, they're, but like the more you can be in that tension and find your, because you can't control anyone else. The more you can figure out how to show up and maintain your peace, even if you're surrounded by communists, <laughs> even if you're surrounded yeah. by people who refuse to look at science, that you can maintain your composure and you can be, you or not, lose your shit. And then afterwards be like, hmm, that was interesting. Why did I lose my shit? What am I here to learn? What's here? And then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Go to your next one and lose your shit a little bit less. So that, that's what I'm doing. A little bit less losing of my shit each time. Yeah. 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 It, that's, that's the one thing that a lot of people struggle with, myself included, is, you know, it's easy to be full of Zen when there's no one around. It's a lot harder to be full of Zen when there are people around. And uh, that's something that takes practice. It's something that, that does take experience. Uh, and, you know, I like I said, I do I do struggle with it. Um, I don't have a whole lot of practice with it, not right now anyway. Um, I have in the past done that, uh, but you know the the the, the lockdowns really kind of screwed that up. You know, you spend a year locked in the house and uh, tend to get up in your th your your own thoughts. Be stuck in your own head for a while. Yeah. 
Yeah, we all lost our social skills over a year and a half for sure. <laughs> if we ever had them. Um, and that is, it's partly figuring out, at least we're all like, cause I lost those social skills long before I was locked in long before the pandemic happened. I oh, lived yeah. the pandemic lifestyle long before that. And so I was in a different place when it happened than other people of like, oh yeah, more of this, gotcha. Um, whereas everyone joining and everyone being in the same boat, like almost everyone's lost their social skills at this point. Nearly everyone is like, oh, I have to human again. No, I don't, I just, you know, and especially the introverts have kind of like, oh, I actually like this better. There's pieces we like of this better and pieces we don't like of it. And yet they're going to be different. What you liked about it is not going to be what I liked about it. So we don't get to pull all of it into it. But like, where can we find our differences and have them fuel this better, beautiful world as opposed to having any difference knock us down to like, okay, well then if we can't agree on what economic system we're going to use or political system we're going to use, then you have no value to me and you're an it versus... Yeah. You know, something I can de I can dehumanize versus like what is because I would I would highly suggest sitting down with people who describe themselves as communist until you can maintain your composure because if you want to murder communists that's on <laughs> you that's not on them like that's that's your thing I, I did do that back at the at the beginning of the year I actually had a communist I still had Facebook I had a communist uh, as a friend on Facebook and I kept trying to talk to them uh, but we we didn't really get into the, the heavy stuff. And as soon as I started, you know, getting a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say antagonistic, but uh, more active in my critique, uh, this person kind of backed off. Which is fine. <laughs> it's not, they're allowed to back off. They're allowed to, yeah, they're, to do they're allowed to back off, but it, it people backing down doesn't really you know lead to better understanding it doesn't uh it doesn't help dissolve the issues that that do exist um no but nor, I do does, believe, nor does debating I do, and arguing debating and arguing i've literally never seen it lead to actual consensus like consensus leads to consensus yeah. but we have a different viewpoint like so there's this concept that I'll try to explain um, the difference and take some backstory. Uh, the difference between understanding and belief, right? If, if what I'm trying to do is get you to believe my belief system, you have to let go of your belief system to grab onto mine and it's never going to happen. If instead of me trying to get you to be a communist, I'm just trying to get you to understand my side that believes communism can have beautiful things, that's a different position. And so we can have understanding. I can understand why you might think the world is flat. I'm not going to believe the world is flat, but I could understand it. And if we're coming to, and, and most debates, most scientific, all of it is, is designed for you're wrong because you don't believe what I believe, as opposed to, okay, let me understand yeah. the world from your position. And then we can find common ground. Yeah, I, I have had, uh, actually, there is a friend of mine. He is in the Discord. Um, uh, he actually gave me uh, compliments because he appreciated how, well, at least when I'm writing, but writing doesn't require, you know, discourse. Uh, I, I, I am able to engage both the Aristotelian and Hegelian mindset. And he he was very very appreciative of that, which is great. It's good. Yeah. I mean, talk to that person more. But just getting a compliment from one person doesn't mean that that's how the whole world experiences anyone. Just because the whole world might experience someone badly doesn't mean they should change. Like it's that's why democracy isn't true. Just because everyone yeah. might like someone doesn't mean that person's at fault. And it does the opposite. Like, just because everyone likes someone doesn't mean they're they're have anything more to offer than nobody liking yeah. someone. In fact, I like people. It's who like are the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers were called crazy by pretty much everyone, but the Wright brothers were right, and they could fly, and they did. You know, if if the rest of society got what its way, they would have been shut down, and we would not be flying flying across the world the way that we do. I mean, I would disagree that just because the Wright brothers were the ones who are, who are 
the ones who created flight doesn't mean if they didn't exist or if they were stopped that flight wouldn't exist now. They aren't the only proprietors of flight. They aren't the only ones yeah. that flight came to and were trying to fly. They're just the ones that it came through. And if they hadn't, like even if Einstein wasn't here, and Einstein's much more tied to the theory of relativity than the Wright brothers are to flying, you know what I mean? Because it was is yeah. more unique. That like even if Einstein wasn't here, we'd still have the theory of relativity. Like it's it's we just wouldn't have it in the exact same way we wouldn't attribute it to Einstein, but we would. That's what science is. That's what innovation is. Eventually, it'll come about. It's just and, who do we know as the person who invented it? And it, it probably would have happened later on too. These people were the first, and it, it they they took directions that other people weren't really taking at at that time. I mean, eventually someone would have come across that that uh, that method, but it uh, God only knows when they would have come across it. So, I mean, yeah. we could be like if Einstein didn't exist, we could be living in a world where right now we don't have nukes, uh, but then right. we also wouldn't have nuclear energy. And the Cold War would probably not have been a Cold War, but a World War. Or we could not have new, like, with this thing. We don't know until we actually yeah. live that timeline, and then that's the timeline yeah. that you all know it as. Okay, I've got to uh, get going, so I'm going to end the recording, i.e. going live. Thank you for right. hanging out. Yeah, Thank you for having me.